folks. So this is Palmbe coming to you again from Tampa, Florida, while we're still confined to our homes. Um, and today's podcast guest is Professor Nancy Huntley. How are you? I'm just fine, thank you. It's great to see you. We very much appreciate um, you speaking with us today, particularly since you've had a very, very busy few months, I'd imagine, but I guess we'll get back to that later. Um, so I have, as your description, a professor of biology at Utah State University and the director of USU Ecology Center. Um, so that's a lot of titles and you've had a long and illustrious career. Can you tell us about your path to get to where you did? So what inspired you to get into science and why is it that you ended up studying what you did? Yeah, uh, I got into science accidentally. I did not go to college intending to be a science. I grew up in a pretty rural place and I'd always spent a lot of time outside exploring and I read lots of history books for kids. So I probably had some uh, innate sort of explorer curiosity there. But when I went to college, I didn't know, I had no, no professional aspirations. I just liked learning things. And the one thing I knew was that I didn't want to be a scientist because I didn't like my 10th grade biology teacher. <laughs> pretty sexist um, and oh, wow. very authoritarian. And so I had certainly bad experiences that nowadays would be explicit sexual harassment and the like, but I really did not like him. And so I didn't know that scientists weren't high school biology teachers, you know, that that didn't mean he was a scientist. So I, uh, I didn't want to be like people like him. I didn't want to hang out with people like him. So I went to a small liberal arts college, Kalamazoo College, which was mm -hmm. a wonderful place for me. And I had to take distributional requirements, three classes in each of a variety of areas. And one of those areas was science, one was math, uh, one was art, one was social sciences, uh, whatever. So uh, I failed the first science class I took. It was a biology class that I took in my first semester, and it was a survey course. And I was pretty shy and I sat in the back of the room and I, I, I just, it sort of wasn't my thing. When I went to college, I really wanted to dig into things and that's probably the way I am now. I'm not very interested in a lot of superficial knowledge. And so the book we used was fine, the course was fine, but it was so wasn't what I wanted to do. So I stopped going to class uh, and I didn't drop the class. So I got an F in it. That was uh, a shock, but, Honestly, I almost didn't care. <laughs> I just, I went to the library and read stuff I wanted and I hung out with people and it wasn't a very practical way to go to school. <laughs> so my beginnings were, uh, were not very positive for a future in science. And then uh, I needed to take these three classes to be my distributional requirement. And I didn't want to take intro classes. Uh, so I talked myself into a freshwater ecology class and uh, the the person who taught it uh, just said, well, you won't know as much as other people if you haven't taken the intro classes, but if you're willing to work hard, it's okay with me. So I took it and it was fascinating. And we did a research project in it. In every science class, actually in, in almost every class I took there, we did some kind of an independent project. So it was the first class I did research in and I, I, was, I loved it. So I continued taking science classes. I took way more than three I needed. Uh, but I didn't want to be a scientist still. Uh, and I also took classes in history. I took American intellectual history classes, which I also thought was really fascinating. And again, we did research in those, so it was totally different research. And then my senior year, I had to declare a major. I had somehow avoided it until then. Uh, and, and this is all true. Uh, and I, I decided I wanted to do ecological research in part because you could do it outside. And I guess I just liked that research more at that point in time. I had run into ecology mostly by pulling American naturalists off the shelf in the library. I, I used to go to the library and just look for interesting things to read. And American naturalist was an interesting title. So I plucked it off the shelf and it was full of all these uh, just fascinating papers from the 60s and early 70s. Um, and so I just kept kept on reading and kept on following. So I applied to graduate school in ecology and evolutionary biology. And then somehow I became a faculty member. It would just sort of walk down the path doing interesting things. And uh, 
I enjoyed it. I consider myself really lucky to have bumbled into something that I really like doing and that I can do well enough to be successful at it. So it's been just a really good luck run for me. That's awesome. And I I think I've said this before in our podcast, but I am always quite envious the American system allows you to be much more flexible as an undergraduate. Like there's no way I would have been doing history classes or language classes. And that's the kind of stuff that I feel that I missed out on. Um, yeah, I was curious about everything. So it was a good fit. For me. I did much better in a small liberal arts school than I would have done. Well, I, I just would have left if I had had to do only one thing. I don't think I, I would have had to find another way to, find things I enjoy. Actually, this might be a good place to introduce the concept of a small liberal arts school. So this is something that perhaps people outside of the US don't know what it means necessarily, because I didn't hear the term until I got here. Uh-huh. Uh, well, they are um, usually four-year schools, though some do have uh, some graduate degree programs now. So they focus on undergraduate education. Uh, they have a really high faculty to student ratio. So you get a lot of personal face time with faculty members. Uh, you generally are able to do a lot more of your own research, your own writing and have feedback on that. And most though not all of them uh, require you to take classes in a variety of areas and they often give you a lot of choice of which classes you take. So there were only maybe two required classes I had to take within the biology curriculum and the rest were all pick and choose. Um, I had to uh, spread them across levels of organization in biology to have some breadth in biology but other than that they were 100% my choice and that um, that probably works for many scientists. We're kind of uh, independent thinkers, I think, uh, mm -hmm. by temperament. Yeah. So David says, are they harder to get into? Uh, well, they have a smaller number of students. So if a lot of people want to go to the same one you do, they probably do have a lower admission rate, uh, but not necessarily. Okay. So it's basically a numbers game. Uh well, it's partly a numbers game. They, they're not state schools. They're generally private schools. Mm -hmm. There are a few state schools built on the small liberal arts college model. My son went to one of those. Uh, so because uh, many state schools will admit you if you have a decent GPA and a high school degree and, and you're a resident of that state. And for liberal arts colleges, there's no such you're automatically in kind of a uh, situation. Okay. Um, so going back to your, your kind of career path, one of the things I was looking up was your Wikipedia page, and it mentions that you did your PhD on a little painfully cute critter called the Pika. Can you tell us um, more about that? I love the description, which was they're kind of like rabbits but with roundy ears, and you look at the pictures and they're pretty accurate. So why was it that you studied that particular little animal? Well, I studied it because it was a good um, model for exploring ideas about herbivory. Uh, and I was interested in how herbivores affect plant communities. And I had a lot of ideas about how to take apart a plant herbivore community, but most of them weren't very practical, you know, doing selective removals of lots of different kinds of herbivores. So you could look at individual effects and community effects. And I bumbled onto pikas because they're central place foragers, um, meaning they have some place where they live and they forage out from it and come back. Uh, and because of that, uh, you would expect them to uh, create a gradient of herbivore pressure. And uh, so they graze more closer to home because the reason that they have a central place is usually the need for protection. So pikas live in tailless piles, rock piles, um, relatively high in mountains usually. And uh, they, they hide down under those, which protects them from predators, like especially uh, birds that might take pikas. Uh, uh, so I had a single animal that created a range of levels of herbivory. And so I could ask, I could, I could test um, how different uh, intensity of herbivory affects a particular plant community. So that's why I looked at pikas. And they, they are charming. They're really cute. They, they make <laughs> wonderful noises. And I won't try to make that noise, though I used to be able to do it. I'm not sure I can now. But it's totally uh, 
unconfusable with anything else. It's very distinct. And they are, they're rabbits, they're Legomorpha. They're in the family okay. that rabbits are in, uh, but they're in a separate subfamily. Uh, they were also interesting because they're little and they're not very abundant. And so people tend to think that things that are small or rare don't have much effect on the rest of the world. And they're a little herbivore that does. Very cool. <laughs> so in the process of um, your kind of your experience in uh, at various levels, you've clearly moved around the States a lot. So how many places have you work, lived and worked in? Well, I haven't lived in that many different ones, but I've worked in a lot of different ones. So I lived in uh, Michigan, Arizona, Minnesota, Idaho, Washington, D.C., and Utah. Those are you think that's not many? <laughs> oh, well, it, it seems like not many. <laughs> uh, but I, I, um, I've lived in tents in Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, uh, Alaska, and probably and all of those other states that I've lived in. So I've worked in a lot in most of the Intermountain West plus Alaska. I'm very which is jealous. One of the best places to live. Yeah. So I mean, for us having been trapped in Florida for basically the year now, I miss mountains very much. Yeah. Well, where I live has been a lucky place to be in times of COVID because we can get outside easily. And now we know that when you're outside, um, you're pretty safe in COVID. Yeah. And uh, so I felt very grateful that I'm not living in an apartment in New York City because uh, you can't get out very easily there without still being in a crowd. For sure. Um, I guess, yeah, we do at least have that advantage in Tampa, which is it's not a very dense city and we can still get out to kind of um, parks and so on. So, you know, um, David says, how much have your interests changed as you move from place to place? Um, well, my interest has always been pretty general uh, in in uh, particular questions about how the world works or general questions about sort of central ideas in ecology. So I studied picus because they were an herbivore and I was interested in, in herbivory as uh, one interesting area of community ecology where you could study coexistence and how much uh, an organism on one trophic level affects uh, another trophic level, what it looks like. Um, so herbivores and plants. Uh, so. I can work in a lot of different places and find it really satisfying. Coexistence ecology, I should never have brought that up. <laughs> it's such a, uh, an abstract idea. Uh, so, and it makes no sense to people who don't have any background in population biology. It thinks like, uh, it seems very silly that one would worry about it. Uh, but from the, the early days of thinking about uh, communities, sort of all the all the plants and animals and whatever that are in a place, uh, and trying to use mathematics and models to formally understand them and understand how they work. There's been uh, this idea that uh, coexistence, well, we know that coexistence requires distinct ways of being in the world, such that for some place that's big enough to support a viable population, uh, each each species is the best, uh, the best competitor, does better than any other similar organisms in that place. Uh, and there's so many kinds of plants and animals and microbes in the world that it's, it's hard to imagine that many, many ways of being different. And when you use simple linear additive models, which is the kind of models that were used for a very long time, um, really mostly until we had computers and simulation and the ability to solve harder problems that involve variation and uh, nonlinearity, which make things much more interesting and are much more biologically realistic. Uh, those kind of models suggested that the world was mysteriously diverse and that it, it wasn't clear that it could even work. Um, so it's a big question in ecology, even though um, to most people who haven't dug into that body of theory, you think, well, what's the big deal? Of course, there are lots of species in the world. Uh, get over it, you crazy scientist. <laughs> Is that an answer that will make sense to anyone but a community ecologist? <laughs> I don't know, David. 
I'll have to check into the chat and see what he thinks. Um, yeah. But I mean, does this then relate to your current research? Because um, again, your Wikipedia page includes some choice terms like biodiversity and food webs. Can you explain what these are and why it is that you're interested in researching them? Yeah. Um, well, biodiversity is really what I've just been talking about. It's uh, the, the large number of kinds of different species that you find in a place. And so that's a, a different way of saying I'm interested in coexistence. That's one. You can look at, at diversity from an evolutionary viewpoint. How do those, how do species and all of the species evolve? Or from an ecological viewpoint, which is more, well, how do they work together so that they can stick around in the places where we see them? Uh, and uh, food webs really is another way of talking about the same idea, except it's based on a different way of analyzing them and trying to understand them. So a major question, a major, who eats whom uh, is sort of a, a base idea in ecology. So all organisms require energy. Um, I'm, I'll overgeneralize eating here because there are ways of getting energy besides biting things and swallowing them, but everything requires energy. Uh, and uh, we mostly eat other living things because that's where the kind of molecules we need to stay alive come from. And uh, so eating and or being eaten are big, um, important processes in biology and ecology. It's basically like, you know, birth and death um, and gaining energy to stay alive and grow uh, or being eaten and uh, losing, losing part of yourself or losing all of yourself. Uh, so a food web is just a list of all the species in a place uh, and uh, with lines drawn between them showing who eats whom. And there are lots of interesting things you can do to analyze a food web, which is a special kind of network. So it's basically a network way of looking at things. So do you have a specific research question that you're trying to answer right now? I, um, I think the answer is no. I think what I'm doing now is really different. So uh, I, I'm half an administrator and I also am becoming much more uh, engaged in public service. And I have, so the research I do now is to some extent collaborative research on what makes a great graduate training program. Uh, what do you do to give graduate students the experiences and the tools and the freedom that will allow them to be successful in whatever the future that we're coming into looks like, which will be pretty different than the world I grew up in in many ways. Uh, so I do that. And then I've been collaborating with David and some of the people he works with on infusing some of the ideas that caught my interest way back at the beginning of my uh, career being an ecologist on how some of the things that uh, fall outside of much of the modeling we do affect these um, ideas of what gets to survive and what doesn't. So what kind of species? And so in the case of what I'm doing with David and other people, it's cells and uh, cancer cells versus normal cells, different kinds of cancer cells. So I've gone back to uh, thinking about why the world is so diverse and uh, collaborating with modelers and cancer biologists uh, to say, of why are cancers so diverse? And how does the cancer human body ecosystem work? And does some of these ideas about um, coexistence that involve um, interesting behaviors and variable environments and things that you model uh, in um, ways that came along later in ecology uh, can you apply those to cancer and get any mileage that would help you understand it better and be able to treat it better? And then in one of the graduate programs I have uh, responsibility for, partial responsibility for is in climate adaptation science. And so that program was funded by the National Science Foundation on their research traineeship program. And the idea there is to uh, put into practice uh, ideas that are generally vetted, so you expect them to work, but to combine them in such a way as to build a, a new kind of graduate training program and uh, make that available to students, evaluate it, adapt it, and try and make 
uh, American graduate education better and more suited for the challenges of the 21st century. Yeah, so you actually preempted one of my questions, which is what is the history of this particular program? Um, I presume it came about from the, an obvious need. Whenever we've spoken to grad students, they always mention the difficulties that they have in trying to get through graduate school, and it's not one issue. And I'm wondering if this was to address um, the kind of struggles that students have. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it came out of uh, a series of reports that uh, were done uh, looking at the very, very high uh, failure to graduate rate in uh, science, technology, uh, mathematics, engineering programs in general, and uh, to think about what really makes a great education and uh, try to evolve education in the U.S. so that it's not so um, non-diverse uh, because the dropout rates of students from uh, from many groups that are underrepresented in science are much higher. Um, many of them begin uh, pursuing science, have interest in science when they're younger, but disappear somewhere from being an undergraduate to being a graduate student. So I think that the graduation rate in the sciences, the completion of a PhD in particular, uh, is only about 50% on average. Uh, it's lowest in engineering, it's higher than in some areas in biology, but it's really high across the board. Uh, people of color uh, disproportionately disappear from those programs, women disproportionately disappear from those programs, and uh, often people disappear late. Uh, like lots of people start graduate school and then find that they may like science, but they don't like being a scientist. And so they go do something else. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just fine. But that yeah. should happen really early. It shouldn't happen after four or five or six years and perhaps borrowing money. Uh, it's just uh, not a good thing. So the attempt was uh, in part to improve that and then in part to just vision how, um, what skills do students need to be more successful if they go outside of academia, uh, which is the, I guess the assumed career path of many graduate programs, especially PhD programs, uh, and has been for a very long time. But the truth of it is that when I finished my PhD, which was 35 years ago, um, most students did not go into academic jobs even back then. Uh, so That's really to... interesting. I didn't realize that. Yeah. So I was so reading. This is not a new problem. This is a problem that's been ignored for a very long time. And I wonder if it's now just more prominent given the sheer number of scientists there are, because I was reading a piece by Ed Yong today, which was uh, kind of on the state of science around COVID. Um, and one of the statistics he mentioned, now I can't remember the exact number, but it, it said over a certain period, we went from having maybe 30,000 scientists to like 200 or 300,000 um, and obviously, you know, this is this is not sustainable if all of those people are trying to get into academia. Uh, that's right. And most of them don't even come into graduate school wanting to be academics, I think. Uh, when I started graduate school, I don't I don't think I had any idea what I did at the end of it. If I did, I don't remember. I just wanted to do more science and do more science. Uh, and it was assumed uh, in the school I went to that we would become leaders of science and that meant getting an academic job. But when, well, but my husband got his degree in the same department maybe three years before I did. And uh, that was the point at which the, uh, the market for recent PhDs to move, move into academia had pretty much collapsed. And at that time, I think it was the, uh, an early economic downturn in the 80s. Uh, but just jobs simply disappeared. So many of the people I went to graduate school with uh, looked with, were postdocs or unemployed for years before they got their first academic job. And um, many of them went other places. Probably a half a dozen people I graduated with worked for the Nature Conservancy uh, it, when they were building out their big science program. So they hired a lot of people. Uh, some of them worked for insurance companies or worked... Uh, in, in finance in some way because they were population biologists. So they could mm -hmm. project you know, the likelihood of doing okay with an investment. Uh, but I would say no more than half of us went into academia. 
So do you personally, looking back on your career, um, ever wish you'd done something else or no? Oh, well, I've done a lot of different things. I haven't had a very standard academic career. Uh, so I guess uh, when I thought about doing other things, I did them and they just didn't preclude staying in academia. So a long time ago, I, um, I was on a nas national research Council review panel. Um, so it's the uh, part of the National Academy of Sciences that organizes reviews uh, that are um, sought by America's leadership. And uh, it was of a program called um, who, Biomonitoring for Ecosystem Status and Trends. It was a big report that had been commissioned uh, as the basis for starting uh, a new US biological survey. Uh, so there was one a very long time ago, but it, it has disappeared. Uh, and it would have been a model similar to the US geological survey, but focused on biology and biodiversity. And it was, uh, that was a transformative experience. So I was 40 years old uh, and I was one of the younger people on the committee. Uh, the person from the National Academy who was the uh, Academy representative on it was a man named Gunter Stent, who was a geneticist who actually wrote the genetics textbook I used when I was an undergrad, which is the only science textbook I've ever really loved. It was a wonderful <laughs> book that tells the story of molecular genetics. I think I think molecular genetics was the title of it. Is that familiar to either one of you? Uh, it may well have been. I know I had a similar sounding book when I was an undergraduate. Yeah. Well, it was a great book. It just started with um, going through the science, you know, bit by bit. Um, here's this, this problem. How do we understand it? Here's an experiment that, experiment that was done. Here are the results. And we keep chipping away at it. So it wasn't facts. It was the story of discovery. And I really loved it. So it was pretty awesome to have him be on the committee. But then it was people from many, many different backgrounds. There were 20 some of us, I think. And uh, none of us could imagine how we were going to do this assessment and uh, give a useful report on it. But together, it kind of magically happened. So that was my first experience doing wildly interdisciplinary sort of synthesis white paper science uh, with uh, an enormous group of people and doing something that was socially and politically meaningful at the end. Uh, so I think that set me on a, a different path of part of what I would do with my time as a scientist. And then I um, probably because of that, I was uh, nominated uh, by the National Academy and then uh, appointed uh, to the Northwest Power and Conservation Council, uh, Independent Science Review Panel, and then after that, the Independent Science Advisory Board. And in that, I worked a whole lot. <laughs> and what I, I think when I, when I took it, I thought it would be interesting. Uh, and I also thought I would learn what it would like to go into consulting. So if I wanted not to stay in academia, maybe I would like that. Uh, and I remember when they described to me what the work would be like, uh, it seemed very straightforward. I'd been on NSF panels and I'd reviewed proposals and um, I had background in wildlife biology. And we're looking a wildlife biologist and they needed to put together a review process and uh, come out with uh, a scientifically, a good framework for assessing the wildlife, um, well, actually all of the mitigation and conservation programs in the Columbia River Basin that were funded by Bonneville Power. Uh, and uh, that was another transformative experience. I ended up doing it for about 15 years, which was um, more than two full terms on each of those two bodies. And in that, I think for the first time, more than anything else I did, the things I knew about science and the conversations I had with people and the, the things that we wrote, which weren't peer reviewed science publications, uh, but we published, I don't know, 5,000 pages worth wow. of reports or something. It was an enormous amount of information. And people, it helped people. People used it and they were able to things that they wouldn't have been able to do without it. And those things resulted in good stuff for the environment and for communities. Uh, so 
So I haven't been a very standard academic. So um, we'll come back to your subject of the subject of helping people. But before we do that, David had a question on whether you think uh, academic and scientific careers have changed in the last two to three decades. What do you think is better or worse now? Have they changed? Um, I think it's. I think it goes back longer than a couple of decades. I think that change has probably been there for the entire time that I've had jobs. So, David, you are what you had in mind was um, this change in emphasis on uh, bringing in a lot of money and publishing a lot of papers. Is that what you had in mind as a change? <laughs> probably be easier if he just made an appearance yes he says okay um so that's been going on for a long time i don't think that that is what the job was like at all for my advisors but it has been what the job has been like for everyone i graduated with i think and it has become increasingly emphasized and i think most of us don't like it um uh I don't like being evaluated. I have always felt it was wrong to evaluate people by the amount of money they raised for the university or by the sheer number of things that they published. Uh, and uh, I think when people want, feel they must have many publications or they must get many grants, um, they don't feel the luxury to take the time to do things that they believe are really important, uh, even if the, because those things often take more time to find funding for and more time to do. So I guess I've resisted that uh, and I haven't been punished for it. So, uh, so I think you don't necessarily have to follow that. But it's a problem. It makes the job much less attractive. Um, I didn't become an academic because I cared about money or Fame. I became an academic, a scientist, because I cared about understanding things and learning things um, and doing things that were of value to students and to other people. Have there been positive changes in academia? Uh, the, yeah, <laughs> I think that, um, so when I was an undergraduate, my advisors were almost all men and the faculty was primarily male. There were two women who were hired in the biology department that I ended up majoring in while I was there. Uh, and neither one of them got tenure. Uh, they were both denied tenure shortly after I left. When I went to graduate school, there was one woman when I started in a department of, I don't know, probably 30 or so, 30 some. Uh, and uh, she did not receive tenure at the end of my first year there. There was another woman who was a half-time lecturer. Uh, after I finished my PhD, her job became full-time tenure track. And sure enough, five years later, she was denied tenure. So there were very few women. Uh, I don't, there were very few African-American, even students in the college I went to and I think there was one African-American faculty member in the entire university that I can remember. Uh, so universities have become more diverse. Uh, they've, there's been more opportunity from people from all backgrounds to find their way into programs and to find mentors uh, who may look and act and appear to be more like them. So I think that's a very positive change. Uh, we're, we're a long way from having solved the problem entirely, but the doors of academia have come open uh, a great deal in the time that I've been around. Yeah, and actually that's, that's well encapsulated. I don't know if you've seen the documentary Picture a Scientist. Yeah. Yeah, which I think was a, a brilliant kind of um, look into particularly the difficulties that women have had in STEM fields um, and the work that, you know, women have already laid down to, to improve the situation for others, which I, if, if you get the opportunity to watch it, I think it's a great, great film. Yeah, um, I did watch it. 
I guess I'm talking generally to our audience as well. <laughs> Although I don't know if it's it's easy to get access to it. At least the the opportunities I had were through kind of societies holding events for us. Um, but so clearly you're you're not just satisfied with being a scientist as your more recent activities will kind of attest to. And it's it's really interesting. We've spoken to two women scientists from Utah and both of them very interested in politics. Um, the other was our guest, uh, Dr. Amy J. Hawkins, uh, mm-hmm. although I think hers is much more local. Tell us about your recent state Senate run. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I was the Democratic candidate for Utah Senate District 25, uh, which is something uh, that in the middle of March, about three days after our university had shut down for the first time while we reorganized to putting all of our classes online. So we canceled classes for three days and went to all virtual. And uh, on the last day that we were turning over, I went down and uh, registered to uh, run for the seat. I didn't really know how to run for office. I thought I could be a good senator. Uh, I knew I could be a good senator. I would be a good senator. Uh, And I thought it was really important to have other voices and uh, people running for office uh, who would help us get by the physical, the the political dysfunction we have in America right now. And I'll only talk about America because that's that's where I live. So that's where I have the firsthand knowledge. It's things are happening in many places as are happening here. But I just find it, uh, I found the 2016 election cycle soul crushing for a year and a half. It was angry and empty of any real discussion of real problems. And so I thought, after the election, actually I joined a political party for the first time in my life the day after the 2016 election. And I did it with the intention of learning how to be more involved. Uh, I thought I could be one of those people. And at this point in my life, it would have no negative impacts on my family. Uh, It would have no impacts on my career. Uh, And so I felt like I could do it and I should do it. And three and a half years later, I did do it. Um, so it was, it was really interesting. So I told you all my, my dirt stories about, um, my fear of public speaking. Uh, and, uh, so in general, I don't really like to just put myself out there. Uh, I had, I had no headshot that I could use to put up <laughs> a website, which is one thing you need to do when you start running for office. And the idea of having a website nancyhuntley.com with my face on it was just so foreign. Uh, But I did it because that's what you do to run for office, you know, so you want to run for office, there are things you have to do. But I would walk out of my house every morning, and I would think, did I really do this? (laughs) And, you know, it wasn't that I didn't want to do it, I did want to do it. And I knew that I would learn how to do it, and I would do it as well as I could. But every step of it was totally unfamiliar, the running for office part. I understand what senators do or uh, what a legislator in general should expect to do and be able to do. And I'm willing to work hard to uh, talk with people and learn learn what they are worried about and what their issues are and learn enough background to be, put creative solutions on the table. So, so in that sense, being a scientist, I think is uh, pretty useful uh, in uh, becoming a legislator or some other you know, public official. Uh, you learn how to get good information, you learn how to compromise, you learn how to vet information, you learn how to share information, you learn how to evaluate things as fairly as you can, uh, you learn not to tune out other people's ideas. Uh, and all of those things I think would have been useful. But running for office, uh, I mean, you, you have to have campaign signs and you have to find people to talk to, and you have to understand what to say to them. Uh, You have to understand what you write on a tiny piece of paper or in one paragraph (laughs) that will be what people want or need to know about you. And I didn't know how to do any of that. The person who helped me um, put together the website uh, kept 
giving me little lectures about, and he tried to say very nicely, what you're writing is terrible, but he would say, you know, <laughs> so you're used to, you're used to getting all this detail and really digging into it, but just step back, just keep it simple. And I was trying to, but I was doing a terrible job. Um, you have to learn how to, how to advertise. I don't know how to advertise. I'm a scientist. We don't advertise. <laughs> uh, it was just, um, I felt so inadequate at the end of almost every day for the first five months of it. Like there was so much to learn and I kept having to do things I didn't know how to do and uh, figure out how to do them. So it was really hard, uh, but it was also really rewarding. I talked to so many people that I probably would not have met if not for this. You know, I, I made appointments with most of the mayors uh, in uh, a dozen different small towns sprinkled around Cache Valley and Rich County. Um, I talked to a lot of uh, leaders of NGOs. I just, I talked to people in business. I talked to uh, people I could meet on the street when we happened to be outside when I was trying to hang information on their door. And I learned a whole lot from that. And I just, I like that part of it very much. Yeah, but so, was, yeah. It, it does sound difficult. And actually, I was thinking something similar to what David's just asked. I mean, you're talking about the, the trouble that you had learning all of this new stuff. But is there anything about your background as a scientist that helped you or um, maybe hindered you being the candidate was the, the idea that you kept going into detail and you were being told to step back? Is that something you feel is typical of a scientist and you have to overcome? Oh, of course. Yeah. People tell us all the time that we're terrible communicators and they're right. I mean, I gave you not very good communication about coexistence, but I, uh, that wasn't what I was thinking I would talk about. Um, and I bumbled through it. Uh, so, uh, but we can say things in short form and in clear form after we get all the background and we think about it. So I don't think that that's bad. I, I don't think you want to have off the cuff, just silly slogans. Um, want to learn. Uh, and one of the, the problems we have right now is just this hyperpolarization of all sorts of issues. Uh, and it seems like there are two warring solutions that keep coming back to the table. Uh, but there's actually agreement about problems that need to be solved. So maybe we just need some different solutions that are acceptable to all people involved or most people involved instead of uh, ones that 50% of the people will go for and that 50% of the people think are horrible. Um, so I think being a scientist is useful. Uh, we question ourselves and I think that's useful in anyone, uh, in any position of authority or any position of public responsibility. It's a good idea to not be so sure that you already know everything and that you're right. Uh, and it's a good idea to be open to learning that you're wrong or learning that uh, you've got one hand on the elephant, but there are many other hands in other places. And if you really want to understand the elephant, you need all those hands working together and talking together. Yeah. Uh, so I think, I think it's not so bad that we make things overly complicated at first. Uh, we just have to remember to get through that. And we can't take forever. Sometimes you have to do things before you really understand them. So I do know that. Uh, but uh, I mean, running... I, <laughs> running for office, which is so unfamiliar. So I did lots of online training uh, and it was helpful, but book learning isn't the same as experience mm -hmm. uh, and online training isn't the same as somebody where you have more back and forth um, and more time to get to know them. Um, so I just tried, I guess if you're a scientist, you, you know, it's okay to try to do things you don't know how to do. That's what we do all the time. Right. So yeah. I guess that was good practice. I mean, what do I have to lose? I've, I've told you, I've embarrassed myself and failed a thousand times. Over, <laughs> so you just try. So as David points out, Utah is a particularly hard place to run as a Democrat outside of Salt Lake City, right? Uh, that is that is true. Cache Valley is um, disproportionately Republican. Uh, there are uh, very few registered Democrats uh, and uh, sort of the the null expectation that is that, oh golly, uh, there weren't even Democratic candidates on the ballot for most offices for most of the years that I've lived in Utah. So the last two elections, 2018 and 2020, there were two candidates for most, though not all offices. 
uh, and usually that was means a Republican and a Democrat. Uh, so yeah, that I had a, lots of funny meetings in which people would say things to me like, you're running as a Democrat? And sometimes they would give me healthy, helpful advice that sometimes Democrats just run as Republicans and then they can win. Or they would say to me, you know, there aren't very many of those around here. You're a Democrat? Um, but we, we need multiple ideas at the table. And uh, we have two major political parties. You can rarely win office from any other background. So we need, to, we need them both to be viable and we need to have solutions people can accept. So now I'm out of the closet. <laughs> I will never be perceived as nonpartisan again, probably. <laughs> yeah. And it, it is difficult because I guess the, the point is that you're, you're genuinely trying to um, understand what people's concerns are and their concerns don't necessarily fall on partisan lines. Like if you ask people what the day-to-day -day issues are, they're likely to be the same on either side, right? That's right. A lot of the the, hy the hyper partisanship, I think, is uh, has been forced upon us um, by um, misinformation and disinformation and political motivation, uh, and that we need to just stop doing that and say, no, we're going to talk about real stuff and talk about real stuff, and that we need to know each other. I. I thought a lot when I was running about how things work, you know, how do things work in Utah? How do things work in Cache Valley? Um, and I knew a lot of the organizations and agencies and uh, governmental structures that were there, but I hadn't thought carefully about how, how they work together and where they work well and where they don't work. And uh, why does responsibility for some things reside where it does? You know, why, why, has, why has that evolved? And that was really interesting and instructive. So I learned an enormous amount from that. Uh, and so the door to being a senator at this moment in time is closed, but running for office opened a lot of other doors for me, a lot of other opportunities of ways to contribute, uh, ways to help rebuild healthy civic structure, uh, which I think we need to do. I, yeah. You can't. We can't make all our decisions just based on soundbite ads. You know? We can't decide who no. to vote for just based on soundbite ads. Uh, and it can't cost a fortune for somebody to run for office because that eliminates many, many, many voices and candidates from ever being able to consider it. So I want, I want those things to change. Yeah, it's, it's actually like, it feels like the American elections are probably more expensive than basically all of Europe put together. The the amount of money that they spend on campaigns, for, for one thing, they elections don't last for almost a year. Um, a lot of places, like barely a month before, you might start hearing rumblings. But um, yeah, just the amount of money I find, I, I always wonder what happens to that money afterwards. Like where, where does it go? I don't know. I did... I did discover really early on that there's a huge industry um, that makes money off of political campaigns. So within days of having uh, filed to run, I started getting uh, multiple emails and multiple mailers every single day about help I could buy, things I could buy for my campaign. So that made me think, well, gosh, I really want this money to go away from campaigns, but that will actually put some people out of work. Uh, yeah. We still have to do that because I think that the, it's corrupt. Um, it's really a corrupt enterprise. There's far too much money contributed uh, and spent for all people to have voices in government. It really biases who gets attention where the big money comes from. And that's wrong. Um, it's undemocratic and it's highly destabilizing and it's unfair. Yeah, for sure. Um, so now that you're a seasoned candidate, would you have run differently and would you run for some other kind of office again? I would run for another office again. Um, what, what, I, what I would do differently, I mean, I would be much more comfortable in understanding when things were likely to come up. Um, there, 
one of the things that I found surprising is how little control you have of the the toboggan ride <laughs> of time. So there, there are moments at which people want stuff from you and they want it right away. And there are other moments at which nobody has any interest in what's going on with the campaign. And you simply have to respond to those. You don't control them. Uh, I don't know if anyone controls them, but certainly not candidates for a uh, state office in a relatively rural state. Uh, the thing that made running hardest this time and that probably had the most limit on what I was able to do with COVID. And so that wasn't particular to my lack of knowledge. Um, it, but it meant talking to people face to face uh, was not often a possibility. And I think if you are trying to change the expectation that only one party has decent people in it, uh, or uh, the expectation uh, that um, we can actually all talk to each other, even if we start out thinking uh, that we have very different ideas. And it's very hard to get around that in any other way than person to person. So we had to use door hangers and um, that's not good enough. Uh, it's good enough to start a conversation with some people, but there were, there were people I talked to for an hour or two uh, and I had a full-time job as well. So it was sort of like having two full so I would get up really early. I would stay up really late. When I started to feel like I can't possibly do anything right, I would go to sleep. And then the next morning, <laughs> it, it all seemed much more possible again. But I think the only way out of where we are now is to have more personal conversations, work together, to talk together about everything. So I started after the 2016 election, I began to talk to people about anything <laughs> that <laughs> came up in grocery store lines, anywhere. I talked about climate change, uh, which I didn't, I think, uh, talk about in just normal, well, of course we will talk about this kind of ways, but I do now. Uh, and I also talk about political things, things that are considered political um, always. Uh, if somebody makes a comment that leaves an opening for it, I, I respond to that opening and I will continue that. I'm trying right now to, um, I will, uh, help bring back to life a League of Women Voters chapter in Cache Valley. Uh, I, think, I think we need that. That's a nonpartisan group. And as you said, and I agree totally, issues are mostly nonpartisan. Uh, but they have the ability to, to foster public forums uh, so that we have more events where people talk about issues or during the times that people are running for office, we have forums or something like that. We don't have to have just debates uh, where yep. people sort of attempt to stab each other with clever, clever words. Uh, we could actually just talk about stuff together. So I'm hoping to get some more civic community kind of um, meeting going on regularly, get more people talking to each other. Okay, has Nancy the scientist changed as a result of this experience? Probably. I mean, I, you know, I think like a scientist and I learn like a scientist, the things that I, um, the skills I acquired as a scientist have been very useful to me. They're transportable in learning about anything. Uh, it's, it's not only scientists who are scientists. It's, it's, that's the way historians learn things. We tell them that they're not doing empirical work, uh, but they are. Um, artists use scientific thinking. Uh, so you asked me if it changed me as a scientist. And I think it changed the subject matter that I am at this point in time most compelled by. So I'm reading political philosophy now, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, things like that, uh, because I'm a scientist and that's the way I have to go about doing it. And when I answer people and I respond to these ideas that sometimes seem to me like they're pretty distorted and um, our misuses of words and misuses of ideas, I like to have, I like to have done my homework before I say those things. So I read history, I read political philosophy, um, I read government, <laughs> and I, I'm doing, so I, I continue to pursue life as with my inner scientist leading me. Fantastic. Um, I don't know how you do that much reading, honestly. I just zone out now as much as I, I loved reading growing up. I would, re I would be one of those kids that read at least a book a week 
And now I just find it so hard to focus on anything. Um, oh, and David says, can you recommend us a book? So you're talking about political philosophy and actually this is the kind of thing that might appeal to him. Yeah, well, actually, I can I can recommend some books that aren't political philosophy, too. So I read a book that I like a whole lot uh, by a woman named Sarah Smarsh, who's a journalist who writes about class in America, and poverty in America and rural areas in America. And I think it's I think it's called Heartland. Uh, and then the, the subtitle is Working Hard and Broke in the Richest country in the world, something close to that. Mm -hmm. I really like that book a lot. Uh, it's a story, it's a personal memoir, but it's also the story of four generations of women, her mother, her grandmother, her great grandmother, and uh, the actions they take in the difficult situations that many people in rural America are put in, uh, or many people, uh, without access to economic resources um, are put into. Uh, so I think that's a pretty great book. I just ordered uh, books by three different people and we'll see if I can come up with them. So I read some essays by a man named James Kloppenberg mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I found his work very helpful and interesting. They're mostly chapters there. There's, I think there's one book that I ordered. Um, who, who is it that I just ordered? There are two people. One has first name Alan and his second name has four letters in it. And I can can't <laughs> quite remember it. Uh, and the other one I just bumbled into that, that I, um, he is a professor at Harvard. His name is Michael Sandel. Uh, and so I read quite a few things that he had written that are shorts and I ordered a couple of his books also. And they combine uh, intellectual history and political philosophy. And I always liked intellectual history. I mean, when I, when I was an undergraduate, I was um, pretty captivated by that in part because I had a wonderful professor that I took my first history class from and it was just so fascinating. But I think I, I just wanted to understand myself, you know, and who, who I was and what my place in the world was and sort of mm -hmm. think about ideas in America and the American experience helped me do that. Tremendous. Well, actually, we'll maybe get you to email exactly the, the books and we'll put links up to those later. Yeah. Um, it might be Alan Ryan. Okay. I mean, I, I, I haven't read his yet. I read a couple of reviews of his and I, and, or I ordered, but I will find them. Marvelous. And I have quite, my bedroom is stacked with books now. I wanted to save the independent booksellers of the world. <laughs> and so I bought a lot of books. Well, that's, I mean, it's always a worthy place to spend your money as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I think we're coming to the end of uh, what we wanted to talk about, but before you leave, we'd like to hear your dirt story. Oh, which one? <laughs> uh, just pick one at random, I guess. Uh, see if I can remember what all I said. I know I told you the story of my first talk for which I received an honorarium. And it was when I was a graduate student, but I was invited to be the feature seminar speaker. And that was uh, way out of the league that I had performed in or thought I could perform in in the past. I'd given talks at meetings, uh, but they were 10 minutes and I was a student uh, and I was still a student. Uh, so I prepared for the talk and I went to it. And uh, when I was introduced, the person who introduced me gave me this very complimentary introduction. And when I stood up, I felt so not worth the $50 that I was going to get for an honorary. I'm so sure I would let them down that I think I lost um, control of my composure. So I stood up and I, I delivered my talk um, clearly and well in many ways, but really fast. Uh, and I, I think I was completely uh, overtaken by adrenaline, by fear, <laughs> fear of not being good enough. Uh, so I gave my minute talk, which I had timed carefully and practiced uh, in between 30 and 35.
five minutes. I, I was talking and I was hearing this voice that was talking very, very fast. And it kept talking very, very fast. And on the inside, I was screaming, slow down, Nancy, slow down. And, but I couldn't slow down. And it just, it all flowed out. And when it was over, I was so embarrassed. Um, my husband was in the audience. Uh, he was also a graduate student at the same place I was. And um, I asked him, if he could understand anything that I said. And he said, well, your slides were really good. So I think it was okay. Uh, and so make, I always make good slides. I'm very careful to use visuals that are interesting and that have enough information that if this ever happens to me again, it happened 38 years ago. Uh, so it probably won't, but uh, I'm always prepared and I always have good slides. And I've learned to breathe deeply and therefore be able to speak more slowly. I think David feels your pain. <laughs> yes, for somebody who, who speaks fast on an average day, and I've seen him give talks, and yes, he also has a tendency to speed up. But in a similar vein, he has beautiful slides to go with them. So, yes, birds of a feather, I guess. I, I would take that. <laughs> I would enjoy working with David. He's, he's got lots of good ideas. Very good. On that note, we want to say thank you so much for speaking with us. It's been really interesting to hear your very varied kind of background and career and particularly your experience as a politician. Like, I don't think I've spoken to anybody who's run for office before. Um, well, I looked up the word politician um, so I would know what it meant. I look up a lot of words now because I think words are being used to mean all sorts of things they don't really mean and it's quite confusing. But a politician is uh, polished and experienced in the art of politics. And I'm not sure I, I meet that criterion yet. I think I'm still safely not a politician even though I have been a candidate. Well, David wants, clearly wants to start trouble. What about the word doctor? <laughs> Oh, I know. I read that too. And I, um, that doctor comes from the Latin word for learning. I think I read that. Uh, and of course, that makes sense because indoctrinate um, is, you know, to, to provide knowledge to something. Um, so I'm okay with being a doctor too. And, Absolutely. <laughs> and I am. When we were when my kids were little, I do remember my son uh, once telling us that we weren't real doctors. <laughs> and my <laughs> husband didn't like that at all. I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> he said, well, you know, I mean, doctors who help people. And that made Richard, my husband, even more upset with it. Yikes. Yes, that, that stings a little, I have to admit. Um, but yeah, hopefully we've dropped lots of knowledge and learning within the course of this uh, recording. Um, keeping in line with the theme for the word doctor. Um, yeah, thank you again so much, Nancy. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you, and it's really nice to meet you. I think I heard you once on either the Moth or Story Collider, is that possible? I have been on Story Collider, yes. <laughs> I heard you on that, and I realized at the end of it that the David you were talking about was David Vasanta. Exactly um, so, right. <laughs> um, so it's nice to actually meet you. You oh, thank you so much. Story Collider. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's, I think the world, certainly within science communication, is very small. Um, but that's now wrapping up science into it, too. It's very odd that you heard about David in such a different context. <laughs> it's a small world. Yeah. Yes. Let's just make sure that we carry on looking after it, small or big as it is. Yeah.